our, our marriage started to, to implode. It, we began going in, in two different directions. And yeah, what, what now? What, what, and, you know, and I can remember that began a series of, of nights, literally of driving to Texas towns on a nightly basis for a while, just trying to find her. I didn't know where she was, but I think, I, I do think that for years I had carried this underlying bitterness, rage, I feel like there's a fight to be had. I feel like there's, I need to stand up for me and I don't know how to. Anxiety is an interesting creature, man, uh, especially anxiety attacks because they can just come out of nowhere. And, and during, you know, during our first year of marriage, I can remember times I'd be driving and thinking I was going to have a heart attack. Got to the point where I, I wasn't comfortable driving more than maybe three miles away from our house. It just jacks with your mind. I want you to think back on your life for a moment. Are you anywhere near to where you thought you would be? Has life thrown you some curveballs? Maybe you have some broken relationships. You know, relationships have a tendency to totally shift the direction of our lives. I have been through divorce myself and it totally altered the course of my life. Can God give me purpose even after divorce? Or am I just stuck holding this bag of lemons? What about character defects like anger and anxiety? Where do they come from? These anger defects can derail me and completely stop me from forward progress in my life. How can God take things like divorce, anger, and anxiety and turn them into peace, joy, and purpose? These are the questions that I want to ask our guest today as he continues his life change story. I'm Eric Hutchinson, and this is the If Nothing Changes podcast. So, hey, friend, thanks for joining me again. So, David, on the last episode, we talked about your childhood, and we talked about a toxic relationship in college that continued to be a struggle for over a decade I want to shift our conversation today to other areas in your life. Let's talk about ministry for a moment. I know you went directly into ministry after college, and I know that you are in ministry today, but would you say that you received a calling to ministry? And if so, when did that happen? Uh, I know some people talk about a calling. You know, did I have a calling to that? And I I can't really say there was this moment where it was like, oh, yeah, man, this lightning bolt came out of the sky, and I knew exactly that's what God wants me to do. Uh, Instead, it was one of those things that uh, everything in my life just seemed to be moving that direction. There was no other direction for me that seemed logical at all. You know, it was like, these are these are passion areas. I love doing this. I love trying to serve the Lord through doing this kind of thing. And so, so music and, and youth ministry. And so that that was the thing. Okay, I'm going to go to college, and and I'm going to I'm going to do whatever it takes. I don't know what that is, but to to become one of those guys. And uh, so yeah. you knew going into college. I mean a Baptist college that you yeah. were kind of headed into ministry. So like you said, yeah. it wasn't a lightning bolt necessarily, but you were headed that direction. Right. And, 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 and as you say that, it makes me just realize the impact that my dad and mom had on me and my youth pastors in that it didn't, it didn't scare me away from that, you know, cause I, I could have said, Oh no, all the, all the hard stuff that I've seen happen with my dad and people or, my youth pastor and students, um, but it, it just, no, it was headed that direction. And uh, you yeah. still chose, still chose yeah. that, even yeah. knowing some of the, the hard stuff there. Right. Well, that's really interesting. And I want to ask you this question about anger because you mm-hmm. had mentioned, and I've talked to you before about anger. So would you say that you had anger issues growing up, or would you say that maybe this toxic relationship, mm-hmm. that that caused some bitterness, resentment, some things in you that, that swelled up, and then that became a problem? Or mm-hmm. when when was the anger thing, when, when did you realize there was an issue there? Well, that's a, that's a very observant question, Eric, because um, there's, you know, I said a while ago that that thing when I screamed at him in college, you know, was kind of my second distinct memory of anger. My first one was in high school when I was student government president and a couple of girls that were on the council with me 
one day just I don't remember I don't know what it was I just remember they questioned something or was kind of were kind of critical of something that I decided to do or whatever and I just remember going to the student council room and locking the door and I threw a lot of stuff you know <laughs> I was throwing stuff everywhere that was first my first kind of temper tantrum that I recall as you know b- before being or after being a kid throwing temper tantrums but but I think I do think that for years I had carried this underlying bitterness, rage, rage is probably a strong word, but just it's kind of that inner thing like I want to fight. I feel like there's a fight to be had. I feel like there's I need to stand up for me and I don't know how to. And so, so I, yeah, I think, I think that, that thing of, of, of even just his the advances that he made toward me and not being able to process that out and feeling alone in that, yeah, I was mad about that. And so that came out later. Yeah. Uh, it came out and maybe built up some resentment or whatever and mm-hmm. eventually exploded maybe in some of your conversations. Did it, did it show up other where, other places in um, your relationships? Pro- probably in my first marriage. I mean, because I'm, you know, I think I was still trying to figure out, Hey, let, let's, let's help him. Let's us together help him, you know? And, um, and I don't, I don't remember us, you know, getting in any kind of arguments or fights over that, but I think it hindered our relationship. And then I was constantly carrying in the back of my head and my heart, Oh, him, you know, he's going to call again this week. How am I going to approach that? What's going to be the next crisis? How, how, you know, and just, um, and she was involved in that because I was involved in that. Right. Your first wife. Yep. Yeah. So, well, this is a great segue. Yep. So you left college, joined uh, a church, mm-hmm. uh, worked as youth and music. I'm, I'm making an assumption yeah. there, but you mentioned yeah. that earlier. Mm-hmm. So you're working youth and music. Uh, you've got this toxic relationship that you maybe didn't even recognize that it was toxic, but you had this relationship. When did you meet your first wife? Was it there at that church? Or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The first church I was working at. Um, yeah. So... Um, she, uh, had become a a part of our church and, uh, and really kind of a part of our youth ministry back in those days, you kind of youth ministry was kind of like, it could be seventh grade all the way up into college, you know? And, um, so she, uh, she was, she was in college and, and, you know, I was fresh out of college and I I don't know, I was probably, um, yeah, a couple of years into this first job as a single guy, you know, and, and uh, and she came along. We met, started dating, and 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 ultimately, yeah, got married. Yeah. So did uh, any of the, uh, and I don't know if you recognize any of your character defects or defunctions, dysfunctions mm-hmm. whenever you were growing up. But mm-hmm. how did that bringing into your first marriage? Were mm-hmm. there any of those things that uh, surfaced or that mm-hmm. you saw? I mean, how was your relationship with your first wife? Yeah, that's man, that's a great question. You know, I think we both went into that marriage with with a very idealistic idea of uh, of just serving God, right? I think that was the biggie. You know, I had had some mentors in my life that I was observing their their marriage relationships, and man, they were just you know doing big things for God. And I thought, man, I, I want my marriage to be like that. And so I think we both were kind of looking at that, emulating that. At the same time, knowing that we both had not uh, maybe had all the groundwork <laughs> that these couples had had, you know, so we kind of almost stepped into a role without the foundation. We knew how to do certain things. Uh, I speak for myself, kind of how to act the part, right? And um, but as far as things that I brought into it, I would say, you know, I brought codependency and people pleasing. In, in, into our relationship, it was hard for me to say no to people in the church or to events, you know. So as a youth guy or a music guy, it's like if another church called and said, hey, can you come do a concert or, hey, can you come speak to our youth? Just like, man, that that makes your bubble, you know, kind of blow up pretty big. And uh, so, man, why would I say no to that, right? God's given me an opportunity to serve, right? But 
so man, I was planning activities out the wazoo for students and and uh, in in churches those days. You know, our days were filled with Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night services, and then I was leading a children's choir, a youth choir, an adult choir, and then planning, like I said, youth activities. Uh, and so being busy made me feel important and noticed, but I'm sure that she felt forgotten and often ignored. Um, so the most important church member in my world lived in the same house and she got basically a lot of my leftovers emotionally and spiritually. And so I love my dad and he, but he was a lot like that too. And he shared his regrets about that with me in his later years. And so, uh, plus I never really, I don't think I saw true intimacy, um, and not talking sexual, but, you know, just that relational on a regular basis kind of thing between my mom and dad. I saw them talk some. I would hear them talk some. But, man, we were we were the 70s, 70s family, man. Come home, have dinner, have the news on during dinner, and then what's our favorite next three shows or four shows we're going to watch tonight while dad falls asleep in the recliner, and then we all ultimately end up in bed and start the routine over again. So, so even how to bring just – what does intimacy look like in, in just meaningful conversation between me and my wife? I didn't know for sure how to pull that off, you know? So that, those are things I brought in. And I didn't even realize I was bringing them in, but hindsight's twenty twenty, right? So when did you – so I don't know how long how long were you married to your first wife, and when did you start seeing um, a problem? Okay. And uh, did that – you know, what happened with that problem? Did you – Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, – we got married in 86, and so, um, man, we, you know, served at some different churches. I moved and, and worked with some different churches, but ultimately, um, in 96, we landed in Texas to be a part of planting a new church that was really, um, the focus predominantly was going to be on on university students. We were in a big university town, and... Um, Man, it, it really, for both of us, it was just kind of like this dream situation. We'd, we'd heard about different ways that churches were doing some things differently, you know, different different approaches. And and I just thought God had exposed me to some different things about that, and I thought, man, I want to be a part of something like that. A buddy of mine I'd known for years approached me about being a part of that. So we, we up and moved, man, from Arkansas to Texas, and to do this thing. And, and it was like living a dream. And, um, but man, just time passed year and a half or so into that. I'm, I'm sure I was still Mr. Busy, but I think it was different in that we both felt like we were on the same page doing less in the church, but with more impact. Right. And so, Whereas in churches I had been in before, I felt like we were doing a whole lot of stuff, not sure how deep the impact was going. And so, so here we are in the middle of doing kind of this dream thing with church, and, and I just remember um, just some of her interests changed, you know, and uh, uh, there was a job change for her, uh, some different people came into her life, and... Um, the context we were in, man, just kind of seemed to draw her in. And I want to guard, you know, her uh, in this conversation. But I, but I'll just say this, that um, our, our marriage started to, to implode. It, we began going in, in two different directions, you know. And, um, and ultimately uh, ended up with her leaving, and which just – turned my world upside down uh, at that point. So here I am involved in this church plant, planting a new church, and my my wife is jettisoned. And, uh, and yeah, what what now? What, what, you know, and I can remember that began a series of, of nights, literally, of driving to Texas towns on a nightly basis for a while just trying to find her. I didn't know where she was. And ultimately, her making contact, and, and, we, and we went through a series of months of, like, you know, um, trying to get back together, uh, counseling. I was in counseling for going on a year and a half plus after that. 
trying to figure out how do I fix my marriage? You know, how do I, how do I fix me? Cause there was stuff I needed to fix. Um, and, um, bottom line, my counselor said, man, I'm going to help you do everything you can do to try to fix your marriage so that you, if, if it ends up good, then that's great. Right. If it doesn't end up the way that you hope, at least you, you know, you've done everything you could. And I, and I always look back and appreciate that, you know? And so I feel like I did, you know, I feel like I did. Um, I, and I, I'm not, it's not like I don't have any faults in our relationship by any means. I know there were areas of neglect for her areas that I, I I'm sure that I hurt her emotionally, you know, and she felt hurt probably brought up some, some bad memories for her, you know, maybe. And, uh, but ultimately, you know, she just, she just didn't want to be married anymore, you know, and it ended in divorce. And so, uh, that was in 2000 and man, that, that moved me into a period of depression, started having anxiety attacks and, uh, yeah, life was, pretty crazy. At that did time. it end ministry work for you or what, what did you do? So, I mean, you, mm. you, you know, the last we heard you were at a church plant. And so, uh, <laughs> yeah. so did that, yeah. did that go South or what, what happened? Oh, that's a great question because, you know, growing up typically that would just be, that's it. You're done. Right. And, um, and so kind of in the middle of this before the divorce had finally happened, um, I called a buddy of mine, actually my buddy that played mandolin and bass with me in junior high school in that little class. We, we'd stayed in touch through the years. And I called him up, and he was living about three hours away from me down in Texas. And I said, hey, man, I'm, just, I'm calling you just to let you know what's going on in my life. And I talked for a little while, and then it got silent. And, and he said, well, David, I'm six months ahead of you in the same process. And, you know, my jaw just dropped. I thought, oh, my gosh, because, you know, I'd been in his in his first wife's um, house and knew their kids, whole nine yards, and he's going through the same thing. I had not a clue. And so we began to walk that road together, you know, checking in on each other. And he was he was learning some things that were helping him in that process, and he would share those with me. And I just remember one day I had to just been at one of my lowest spots because inwardly you're thinking, okay, my marriage is imploding. I haven't told my mom and dad because I just thought, I don't know, I think I, I thought my mom would have a nervous breakdown. I didn't know what, what it would do. And so I'm, I'm, I'm carrying that, and, um, and, I, and I am thinking, man, this could be it. This could be it as far as, like, you know, ministry career is concerned because most people don't survive this and, and still – keep a ministry job. And I just remember my buddy saying, Hey David, look, this is going to be hard to hear and you may not believe this, but I'm just going to tell you, um, there's still hope and God's still got a plan for you. And my response, very holy response was you better be right. <laughs> cause, cause inwardly I, 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 I knew what he was saying, but I thought, nah, I don't know. You know, and so, um, so yeah. So you're divorced. Mm -hmm. You, so you've got this little conundrum here. You're, you're a minister. Uh, you were in ministry, mm -hmm. but now you're divorced. And I don't know mm -hmm. how long all of that took, but so where do you go now? Yeah. What, what's next? Man, I, um, yeah, I, I distinctly remember being in Texas, being in the place where for a year and a half, there's just a lot of bad memories, okay? Um, and just I remember one day just telling the Lord, Lord, I'll stay here as long as you want me to stay here. I'll do whatever you want me to do. There came a point where a buddy of mine I'd gone to college with, uh, uh, here in Rogers, he was living in Rogers, and he was pastoring... Um, a new, a new church. And he and I had actually served together in another church previously, but he called me and he said, David, we hadn't talked in forever, but, but I, uh, I heard what happened. And, um, I'm just calling to say that, that our music, our music minister has moved uh, to Missouri and, um, 
I don't know if this would be good for you, but if you would consider uh, coming to Northwest Arkansas and just being a part of this, he said it's it would be part time, but uh, maybe maybe you need a place to heal, and I think our church could be a good place for that. He said I know a place where you could get another little part time job, and and I I just. I thanked him for it, told him I'd pray about it. And I just remember driving around in, in my truck in that Texas town and just and just having this sense again from the Lord of, in essence, man, you're released from here. You're done. You're done. You can go. And, um, and I decided I'm going. And so, so uh, I moved back uh, in 2000 uh, to northwest Arkansas. And to start over, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So you took the part-time job at the church, yep. right? And so uh, let's move into your current wife, Karen, yep. Yep. Uh, who I know from high school yeah. because she's from this area. <laughs> yep. So really interesting. So uh, why, how did you meet her? Mm-hmm. And then how was that first year in marriage as you were bringing in all the baggage mm-hmm. from your past? How did all that go? No. Yeah, that's, that's good. So, um you know, moved back to Northwest Arkansas, and I, I do take this church job. and And I, I was teaching at a little Christian school part time, teaching music, and still wasn't making a great income. And so I took on some uh, guitar students, just teaching guitar on the side. You know, and so they all get their heads together and decide that Karen needs to go to the church one Sunday and meet me. And they've been telling her about me a little bit, and. And, and I think Karen just decided, you know, I, I'm going to go, but I'm just going to make sure that they're not all a part of some whacked out cult church, you know, and uh, before I ever meet this guy. So, so she went and, and we met that day, you know, and honestly, I was at a point I'd tried to date just a little bit and I just, I'd, I'd given up on that. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. Trying to jump back into the dating world. And I'm like, Okay, God, if that's something you want for me, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to pull that one off, you know. Well, he pulled that one off. I mean, it, it was just amazing uh, that uh, Karen and I met that day, and inwardly, I'm like, I'm not I'm not looking I'm not looking for anybody. And uh, Karen thinks I set this up, but I didn't. But mysteriously, I think by God's hand, we ended up at at the house of some people that night for a, for a community group, and 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 it was in the summer. And the community groups, basically, in the summer, we just, everybody who came to church that day threw their family's name in a hat, and they drew them out, and, and like, 10, 10 families or however many would go to this house, y'all would go to this house, whatever, you know. And uh, it was just to help kind of mix us up in the summer to help you get to know other people. And, and yeah, lo and behold, who, who ends up at the place where I'm at? Karen does. <laughs> and... Uh, and, and through that, man, um, it was like God uh, very quickly made it clear, I've brought you two together. And Karen had been through a similar situation as me, and uh, she knew very, she had a very uh, clear list <laughs> that, uh, thank God that I guess, you know, I passed the test, and uh, but I, I knew... I knew what I wanted and what I didn't want, and she was the same. And uh, we met, and and it wasn't too long before uh, we got married. Yeah. So, you know, back to anger, you mentioned even anxiety attacks mm-hmm. and some other stuff. So what were some of the challenges that you and Karen mm. have dealt with in your marriage, mm. which there's been many years, and what would you say would be uh, maybe a turning point for you? Oh, that's good. Well, yeah, you know, coming into the marriage, interestingly enough, the anxiety attacks, attacks had not subsided. They had not gone away. And, I, you know, I'd done a lot of counseling about my divorce. I'd been through a divorce recovery group down in Texas. Um, but I, I, I think the whole anxiety attack thing um, was probably just some underlying still like, um, what am I going to do? Who am I going to be? When, when am I going to get back on the career path? What's, you know, and I, and I was working and, and, and doing that, but I think there was just a lot of still underlying fear and insecurity, you know, um, and, uh, and, and still, 
probably some underlying anxiety still about the guy from college because yeah, that, that relational door was still kind of open, you know? Um, and I, you know, I tried to be a little bit more, uh, intentional in some things in that relationship, not letting myself be run over and, and, um, but, um, yeah, it, it, anxiety is an interesting creature, man, uh, especially anxiety attacks because they can just come out of nowhere. And, and during, you know, during our first year of marriage, I can remember times I'd be driving and thinking I was going to have a heart attack, you know, or got to the point where I, I wasn't comfortable driving more than maybe three miles away from our house. It just jacks with your mind. And, and all I can do is just say, thank God for Karen, because she walked with me through that, tried to understand what was going on as best as she could. Um, so, um, I, I think in that context, um, as we were able just to talk about it and she began to understand it and, and I continued counseling, um, it, there, there came a point when, when the anxiety attacks subsided. And I think that could go hand in hand to with, with being involved, uh, with celebrate recovery, Ultimately, uh, I came on staff with uh, Fellowship Bible Church in Rogers, Arkansas in 2010 to work with Celebrate Recovery. And, and even though that's quite a few years in, I think um, uh, just being able to process out a lot of that stuff from the guy in college was, was huge with some other men. I'd processed it out some with a counselor and a, and a good friend and as well. So I think having kind of let a good friend into what all happened and for him to just go, man, I'm sorry that happened to you, but I still, I still love you, bro. You know, was probably the first steps to some of that anxiety beginning to subside, you know? Did you ever process where you felt like maybe the origin of your anger came from? I think honestly, as I look back, I think, um, that whole memory like from high school with with the student council gals and um and then what happened with the roommate in college if i think about kind of two words in that insecurity and and being attacked you know i think any time that something was happening to me that made me feel insecure it really wasn't attacked an attack on my person, but but I took so much into account. If you are criticizing me, then I I must be bad. And and instead of getting depressed about that, I think for whatever reason I wanted to to just bounce back and maybe maybe <laughs> maybe show you how bad you are. I don't know. There was there was this kind of this fight nature, you know, fight or flight. And and instead of fleeing, I think, uh, I was trying to figure out how do I defend myself? I feel really insecure right now. How do I defend myself in this? And, and, and I feel like I'm being attacked. And, and so it's kind of interesting. I, I don't know where, where are the roots of that? Is that from being an only child and not knowing, you know, there's times when I wish that my, my brother had lived, it had been a couple of years older than me. And I wished with that, I could have fought with him had a scrap in the backyard, do all the things that brothers do and learn how to walk away with that, uh, walk away from that and things be okay. You know, uh, you know, there, there's just kind of that missing part of my, my, uh, uh, relational thing that I think, yeah, it would have been cool to have had those experiences and kind of learned some people skills, but instead, uh, yeah, I think anger is very much a little bit of just a fight and a protection mechanism. So what tools have you learned to cope with the anger issues or mm -hmm. with uh, even some of the other um, stuff that you've mentioned in our talk here? Mm -hmm. what, what tools have you learned that you can, that you can uh, co combat these, these uh, issues in your life? Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, the Bible, you know, tells us uh, to be angry, but don't sin in that anger. And so anger is an emotion. I mean, it's a God-given emotion. And and um, there's good kinds of anger and there's bad kinds of anger. And so I think one of the tools is 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 looking at when when I feel angry, 
what's this coming from? What what's underneath the surface? You know, it's kind of like you can see an ocean, and there's a, the tip of an iceberg on the top of that surface, and maybe that represents uh, my anger. That's what's coming out, kind of out of the surface of of my my being. But then get under the water, and what's underneath that? You know, so. So for me here right now in good old 2023, um, what I know for me is when I typically have some kind of anger outburst, you know, whether that's a few years ago, you know, throwing the weed eater across the yard uh, because it wouldn't start or, you know, throwing some cinder blocks uh, (laughs) in the backyard, you know, it's like, am I mad because the weed eater won't start? It could be, but probably if I stop for just a moment and go, you know, why am I, why am I taking this out on the weed eater? Really, you know, weed eaters are they're going to start and they're not going to start, right? But what's going on in my heart today? Well, somebody at work said something that made me feel insecure or attacked, and instead of healthily maybe standing my ground or talking through that, I. Maybe I just stored that down in my heart and stuffed it. And so who ends up getting the brunt of that? The weed eater or or maybe even Karen, you know, because uh, she doesn't know what's gone on. She doesn't know what somebody may have said or done, but that can come out in sarcasm or, uh, you know, just a, a raised voice when it doesn't need to be raised, you know, um, and so what I've had to learn, and I'm still learning this, Eric, is 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 the what's behind it, what's behind it. Will uh, in celebrate recovery, uh, we have uh, uh, these little pamphlets that, about anger, and one of them, one of the things says, take a nanosecond, just take a nanosecond uh, to to invite God into that moment, you know, and and say what's going on. What's going on? A nanosecond's really short, but it's like my my temper is shorter than a nanosecond. So so it's like, can it can I stop in this moment, put the weed eater down or whatever it is, step aside and go, God, what what's behind this? Because I feel it. It's it's burning in me. Uh, and it's gonna come out on on an object or it's gonna come out toward Karen. I've never hit Karen or anything like that, you know. It's but but she she's seen me when I'm like a bull in a china closet, you know, and 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 I so I think number one is just can I take a nanosecond and just stop and go what's what's behind this? Okay, I'm mad at the weed eater, but did something else happen today or yesterday? And it's just starting to boil over. The tip of the iceberg is showing, but I know what's beneath beneath the surface. Um, the other thing I think for me that's that's really helped with the anger thing is simply talking to somebody. Call somebody. Call for me again in recovery. Uh, I've got two or three guys that I know. I can call them up and say, "Hey, dude, I am. I'm on the edge of a cliff right now. I am ticked. Here's what happened. Help me." And um, there's just something about picking up that phone and and just even just letting it out with somebody else who's not involved in it. Uh, that begins to give relief, and then for somebody to give some objective uh, feedback is huge. It helps me. Sometimes it helps me think. Is when, at least for me, speaking for me, if I'm mad toward a rage, I'm probably not going to be able to think necessarily real rationally. <laughs> helps to bring a brother in, you know, into that. The the last thing I would encourage to is is to process the pain, the anger out on paper. I'm not a daily journaler, but when I do journal, I try to be gut level honest. And there are times when, when God, he, he did that for me. Uh, when my wife first left, the only way that I found that I could pray and process was through writing Mm. in a notebook. And, um, I think there's times, uh, when the anger it's just good to, to get the piece of paper out and write. And you can burn it afterward if you need to, you know. Um, but process it out. There's some, there's there's a way that God uses that that I don't understand, um, but he does. And so 
All of that encapsulated, Eric, a summary is you got to stop. You got to call a timeout. Either you're going to act out on the anger or you can call a timeout. And, and what are my tools? What are my tools? A nanosecond with God, some time with somebody else on the phone or in person, taking some time to process it out on paper. You know, that's, that's kind of some simple tools that I use. So, David, we've talked about a lot Mm -hmm. of different things. I mean, through your life, you've had some anger issues. You've had some toxic relationships. You've had some anxiety, maybe a little codependency. Mm -hmm. You've got some things going on in your life. So the person that's listening, and maybe they're going through some hard things in their Mm -hmm. life. Maybe they've gone through a divorce. Maybe Mm -hmm. something's happened in their life. So where is God in all of this. Mm. I mean, can you see a thread in Mm -hmm. your life from where God has guided you, put his hand on you? Mm. You know, what would you encourage a listener who says, Mm. you know what? I have tried everything. My life is a wreck. Is there any hope? Well, well, I'm going to tell you the words of my buddy down in Texas, right out of the gate. There's, there's still hope. And God really does still have a plan for you, even though you may be hurting to the very depths of your core, because I've been there. But I decided to believe my buddy. There's hope, and and God still has a plan. Okay, that may not happen tonight, may not happen this week, may may take a few weeks or months. My encouragement to you would be, hang on, that God loves you, or his love is 100% directed towards you. And sometimes it's going to be hard to understand why he doesn't step in. But... Uh, give him time. But I also encourage you to know that sometimes he he may be waiting for you uh, to make a next step, you know, and that could be, I, I need to get a counselor. I need to find a trusted friend and tell them what has happened to me. I wasted a lot of years carrying a lot of stress and anxiety. You, you can't carry it forever. You need to let somebody into it, you know, bring it into the light You carried it in the darkness too long. Thanks, David, for sharing your story with us. Hey, if you are listening today and maybe life has thrown you a major curveball, maybe it's divorce or maybe it's some other pothole in life. Maybe you are struggling with some character defects that just won't go away. I want to encourage you that God can heal you from those character defects and he can repair any pothole life creates. All he asks is that you surrender your life into his capable hands. Change is possible, but if nothing changes, nothing changes. See you next time.